Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Nellie Y. Pinkra is a research assistant at Technical University in Dresden, Germany, with the Chair for Digital Cultures. She is interested in black studies, media and technology, poetics and politics, critical pedagogy and practice, and speaks, write, and workshops for magazines, organizations, and institutions. Her doctoral thesis about Edward Glissant, Histories of Technology and Cybernetics, is finished at Lufania University Lüneburg, where she is associated with the Center for Digital Cultures and an alumni of the, res the research training group Cultures of Critique. Nellie is a senior fellow with Humanity in Action, part of the German Forum Anti-Racism Media Studies, and member of the Gender Media Affect Network. And I just like to say, um, Nellie's the only person today that I, I, this is the first time I'm actually meeting Nellie, and I've, I've really wanted this encounter to happen for years, um, because I, um, when I was a PhD student, I wrote my dissertation on um, Glissant's theory of opacity in relationship to biometric facial recognition uh, more than 10 years ago. And it's just really wonderful to be able to connect with someone that's also engaged with Glissant's thinking in relationship to computation and cybernetics. So um, please, everyone, give a warm welcome to Nellie. Hello, everyone. Um, Zach, thank you so much. Uh, for the invitation, first and foremost, I'm equally, and I want to say more excited even, because I think your engagement with uh, Glissantian thought and theory, the way you approached it, has actually really made me want to stay in academia a, a long time ago when I wrote my master's thesis. So. This encounter to me is really like somehow a little like full circle moment, but also just I'm incredibly honored to be here and that you invited me and I'm actually really, really happy. Um, thank you so much. And then of course, yes, um, thank you to the museum, to uh, to you, Jort, was, where is he? Ah, there. Uh, thank you for making this possible. I got up at 3.30 in the morning today and uh, I was brought here and I would do it again, although it was awful. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, so Zach already said a little bit about my dissertation, um, which I'm writing about Edouard Glissant and histories of technology. Um, that's right. And I think I will give you a little like glimpse into it today with like a special attendance or focus on, of course, the themes. And I think uh, after now you provided me with your uh, introductory remarks um, that there will be some pretty interesting uh, resonance as well, I hope. Um, lastly, I don't have any visuals at all. And uh, by the end of the talk, hopefully, uh, you all will understand why and also what I've tried to do here. There is a purpose behind it, so it's not that I'm just lazy. Um, right, so uh, let's begin. When I ask my students, my parents or friends, you know, when I read uh, the MIT annual list of the 10 breakthrough technologies um, of the year, the answer to what we understand technology to be often mirrors a Silicon Valley propagation of the concept promoting innovation and progress, uh, developing systems and devices to enhance, to make money, to make a name for oneself in the tech world, and so on. Technology in that sense is, of course, somehow connected to the human. Machines, gadgets, electronics, computers, or AI, they are all developed by humans. They might assist humans. They structure society in our everyday life. That's all the things that we know. And as some transhumanists might have it, certainly technologies endanger the human species. The idea of the technological singularity has become all too familiar in recent years. Technology is then, in that understanding, other than human as well. It is tangible, physical, and singular, and I want to offer something else today. Ursula Le Guin said, um, technology is the active human interface with the material world. It's technology how a society copes with physical reality, but the word is constantly misused to mean only the enormously complex and specialized technologies of the past few decades supported by massive exploitation both of natural and human resources, as we all know. 
This is not an accept acceptable use of the word, uh, Ursula Le Guin says. Technology and high tech are not synonymous, and a technology that isn't high isn't necessarily low in any meaningful sense. I'm quoting another uh, person that is uh, deeply inspiring to me, um, the poet and, and musician uh, and a lot of different things, political activist Saul Williams. Um, a video of uh, a conversation he had uh, at an event a couple weeks back surfaced on my Instagram wall and I watched it and as often with Saul Williams content, I was really engaged with it and I think at least, I don't know, 20 people sent it to me then afterwards because um, he said something that I have been saying, I think, in a couple of talks um, and that I have been arguing for, and so I want to quote him. Um, and this could have been the only thing that I showed you today as a visual, but I'm reading it now because I'm not showing any vis visuals, as I said. When we look at modern devices, as long as they are dependent on those unnamed workforces in the Congo and all of these resources, I'm not impressed with that te as technology, because technology is supposed to move us forward. And so the technology that we represent, the technology that we represent through poetry, through coding, through language, it can be ignored, it can be slept on, it can be renamed slam, it can be renamed spoken word, you can call it whatever the fuck you want, but there is purpose in our technologies and the technologies that we represent and the art that we have to offer. In the current edition of Real Review, Schumann Bazar said, we're right at the frontiers of what language can do. And actually, I want to situate a little bit um, where I'm speaking from here today as well, because um, I live in Austria at the moment. I grew up in, in Germany, um, where there has been a really unprecedented crackdown on freedom of speech, academic freedom, the right to demonstrate for certain bodies and certain positions in the last month. Uh, where there's an immense authoritarian push and, you know, a long prepared alignment with right-wing positions in politics. It's really a very dangerous situation at the moment. And so I think, you know, Schumann Bazar is absolutely right. We are right at the frontiers of what language, is, what language can do. We, and I speak of a we because, you know, I have to assume that something like it exists. We have traded these frontiers of what language can do. We have pushed them and left them again and again, and we see how quickly concepts we have fought for and deliberated, we have developed and worked on, a language we have actually worked on, which was hard work, how quickly all of it can actually be redefined. In our endeavors, anti-colonial, decolonial, or otherwise, we set out to redefining and rearticulating, even redeeming, narratives, words, stories that ought to adjust the countless injustices of past and present. But the moment of their redefinition, as we now again absolutely know, is lies in the power to establish, impose, and enforce that which is redefined. Writer and political geographer Sintujan Varataraja calls language a landscape. And it's precisely this landscape that is our means that we have at our disposal. And it is the terminology that really defines the boundaries of our knowing and our imagining. So what I want to do in this time today um, that I have is discursively, a little discursively, map out opacity um, to, as Zach wrote in his description for today and also I think mentioned uh, in the morning, to stage the encounter of course you mentioned it, but I think quoted it exactly like this, staged the encounter between Edouard Glissant and Yukui. So this is my second part. Uh, let's call it after opacity. Opacity is the opposite of transparency, but not darkness. It's not anonymity or privacy, it's not, can be obfuscation, but not destruction, it's invisibility, neither visibility nor light, it's intelligibility, but not known, not to be known, and not unknowability or secrecy. It is acceptance, it protects relation, it is that which defies translatability, rational understanding, a Western episteme. Truly, opacity has been engaged as metaphor, idea, and concept from artists and scholars, as well as through different media forms. Over the last two decades, if anything, 
this concept has proven to be of importance. It has proven to be a coveted word, a word suitable for describing different modes, qualities, and contexts and circumstances. It evokes much and has provided a vocabulary for practices deemed to be resistant or antagonistic, post, de, or anti-colonial. It apparently offers something. It offers a language and an imaginary for, a specific, for specific acts or labor of liberatory capacity. By virtue of its own applicability, opacity has become a strategy of resistance, a language as and of resistant practice, just as Edouard Glissant, of uh, whom you have heard today, of course, already, has conceptualized and exemplified it throughout the entirety of his monumental work. Glissant wrote, as many before me have noted, defying genres from poetry collections, novels, plays, and essays, political essays, and uh, philosophical, like theoretical texts. I think he had a bit of a problem with um, how we define to be theory. In 1969, Glissant formulated the now prominent right to opacity for the first time, but even before this proclamation, and well after, he positioned opacity manifold. Theoretically, as a form of epistemic resistance to the projection of Western thought, the projection of Western thought was a quote, its rationality and obliterating provincialism, a projection that disseminates and innate, again, the sentence was crude. Theoretically, as a form of epistemic resistance to the projection of Western thought, its rationality and obliterating provincialism, a projection that disseminates an innate injustice. Okay, now I understood it myself. <laughs> Glissant has always been and remained committed to a materiality of language the work that it does, as Ray Cho has framed it, which could also be phrased as, you know, the role that language plays or the functions it performs. Glissant thus also practiced opacity in and through language. His thought was still never detached from the materiality of the conditions of everyday life. Rather, his unequivocal involvement in anti-colonial movements, Martinique's and other independent struggles, and the political per se, was part of that materiality. If anything, his work has complicated notions such as materiality or history, among others, precisely because he thought from the point of the specificity of Martinique, the archipelago creolization, that which could have been considered provincial in the context of and for the whole world. Uh, the whole world is also, well, a concept um, by Edouard Glissant that uh, he, I think, first introduced in a novel that was called Mahagoni, in 1987, um, yeah, and I mean, this is a side note a little bit, but um, it's an interesting one, I think. So in Haitian Creole, um, and also in Martin Martinican Creole, and Antillian Islands, the term to moon means everybody, so to monde, or whole world, so Glissant wrote in French, of course, um, whole world is what it was translated to, designates an entirety or like even a totality, which is also what Glissant writes about a lot. Um, yeah, so just a side note. So thus, opacity can be the clarity that occurs in the dark, which is a quote by Neal Aller. As much as the hapticality or like the structure of a piece of paper where the ink touches this paper. It refers to the facilities of the environment, for example, the impenetrability of the hinterlands in Haiti or other Caribbean islands, the forests, which became the condition of possibility of marronage as both an action and a practice, and following that, an imaginary. I'm quoting Glissant. The forest is the last vestige of myth in its present literary manifestation. In its impenetrable nature, history feeds our desire. The forest of the maroon was thus the first obstacle the slave opposed to the transparency of the planter. No way forward in the trees. Opacity refers to the nature of all relations in the world, therefore also the self and the other, to their constitution through language as itself a construct and at the same time the only tool to grasp and then reflect on given constitution. In his account of the Haitian Revolution, the historian Julius Scott uh, gave us an image of this era, um, an incredible, really incredible historical study, I recommend you all read it, um, that uh, has not like that been in the focus of attention before. It's called The Common Wind, Afro-American Currents in the Age of the Haitian Revolution. 
It's a brilliant title, really, and uh, I'm quoting Markus Riedeker from the foreword. Julie Scott is attending to the unknown mode of conveying intelligence amongst Negroes. It is the secret communication networks of the enslaved people, the question of how information traveled between, between geographies and people that had no rights, possibilities, or means to certain or almost all information. It is the communication networks of the era of the Haitian Revolution that are embodied in this expression of the common wind. In 1961, Glissant wrote a play about the Haitian Revolution, which is called Monsieur Toussaint, in which the convergence of languages as worlds, languages as worlds, always already related and conditioning each other's conditions of existence is what he is concerned with. About the plantation system, Glissant has written countless times in almost all of his um, texts somehow. Um, and the era of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, but in Caribbean discourse, he writes, and I want to quote this. Since speech was forbidden, slaves camouflaged the word under the provocative intensity of the scream. No one could translate the meaning of what seemed to be nothing but a shout. It was taken to be nothing but the call of a wild animal. This is how dispossessed man organized his speech, by weaving it into the apparently meaningless texture of extreme noise. From the outset, that is, from the moment Creole is forged as a medium of communication between slave and master, the spoken imposes on the slave its particular syntax. For Caribbean man, the word is first and foremost sound. Noise is essential to speech. Din is discourse. This must be understood. In his extensive negotiation of the emergence of Creole, its conditions of possibility, which are, of course, unimaginably violent, and then also more than that. And in how Glissant derives the principle and force of Creolization, he asserts that Creole is not a language of being, but a language of the related. And I want to ask, is this not exactly what the philosopher Yukui attends to in his conceptualization of cosmotechnics, of which you've heard today also, which represents a multiplicity of technological experiences that are culturally and cosmologically situated and argues, and he argues that we recognize and value the diverse ways in which different cultures understand and construct technology in the first place. While Hui's analysis is quite extensive, and I won't be touching on all of the issues because it's really like, it's so broad and um, deep as well. Um, so he touches on, you know, neo-reactionism, the end of the enlightenment, cosmopolitanism, post-pandemic politics, and more like planetary thinking. Um, I wanna touch that he, upon that he em emphasizes the importance of rediscovering and appreciating historically traceable and still protect productive techno-diversity. This, he argues, is crucial for questioning the ontological and epistemological assumptions of modern technologies and their limits, especially in the context of the Anthropocene and beyond technological planetarization. The particular interest in and engagement with the concept of opacity, especially from film and media studies, and I mean related fields of course, is a reflection of the media technical condition of the last two decades. Many of the adoptions of opacity emerged in response to a very particular understanding of transparency, which is an equally stretched and recurring term that mostly refers to its epistemological and ethical implications. The semantic structure of transparency reveals many of its functions. For political discourse and in society, transparency as promise, as ideology, necessi necessity. And analyses of, these semantic of this semantic structure also reveal how the metaphorical, that is, relations of light and shadow, the dark and monstrous, of visibility and invisibility, understanding, non-understanding, things like that, construct ideas and ideology knowledge and consequently, our world. Epistemological implications for why and how to best understand subject and object, how to perceive, constitute, and create them in the first place, have often been described as a Western mode of understanding, a form of capturing. 
This idea of transparency is really among the guiding forces that have led to the subjugation of humans, their exploitation and control. The penetration, violence, and controlling effect of the gaze about which, uh, about, yeah, which uh, a lot of people have written, like Du Bois, Fanon, Bell Hooks, uh, Sarah Ahmed, and many more. So this gaze, for one thing, and the making, forcing, and leaving all things visible have been theorized in numerous times, arguably most famously in the form of Bentham's Panopticon by Michel Foucault. The sociologist Simon Brown's uh, 2015 book, Dark Matters, on the surveillance of blackness, offers a crucial point here that is a point of transformative power, I think, when she likens the Panopticon's architecture of surveillance and control to that of the slave ship as it was used for the transportation of enslaved people for centuries. Brown shows the lineages between current patterns of racial categorization through surveillance and biometrics to modes and strategies of surveillance that were paramount during the time of active enslavement of people of African descent in the United States. With the large-scale rollout of social media networks, so Facebook was launched in February 2004, so uh, we had a 20-year an anniversary this year, the mass deployment of surveillance and facial recognition technologies from borders to smartphones to marketing and advertising and of course the unabashed collection, storage and utilization of user data, ethical concerns for anonymity and privacy have sort of become assimilated to whatever form of capitalism we think we have today. Well, like, yeah, cognitive digital surveillance, uh, any type of this. Transparency has thus become a problem for the masses while at the same time still being stratified and operating through racial and other oppressive and oppressing orders. Of course, Zach's work has been decisively addressing this techno-political reality in relation to Glissant's right to opacity. Zach has offered a theoretical negotiation, not only in his uh, dissertation, but throughout his, in the entirety of his work, um, especially also the artistic work the facial weaponization suit, the face cages, um, yes, and all of your work. Within Zach's, <laughs> Zach Blass's framework, opacity or operates on the level of biometric unrepresentability and a critique of normativity. I think what is especially of importance in your work is that you highlight the ambivalences and contradictions that emerge in a political sphere that demands not only visibility but legibility of minoritized groups and identities. You also mentioned that Ramon Amaro was here yesterday and um, I was on an event with him where he also spoke to this and I think that there is uh, also a crucial point that he makes in referencing the work of Franz Fanon in relation to um, this political order, where there is a constant kind of tension between illegibility or illegibility, some form of opacity that we have to kind of perform almost, and then the systems that cannot really recognize it but become themselves opaque, of course. So when he spoke to this in reference to uh, Franz Fanon, it was in terms of the crisis of representation. The important differentiation he made is part of the complicated or rather impossible status of the political today. While there is a technological demand for legibility in a system in which the algorithmic has become the new mode of relation, that itself is illegible uh, to many, there is a social political demand for opacity. This is essentially the danger of any or to any social imaginary, Konrad Moriarty Hall attests. What is legible or readable that is like markers of identity, race, ethnicity, also health and finances, things like this, is always already that which has been rendered computable, processable and thus logical under the states or whatever controlling system. In some of my own writing, I explored Glissant's opacity as well as a method, a strategy, uh, namely for a while as a decolonial strategy in its potential correlation with a cybernetic epistemology. My engagement on one hand focused on the decolonial study group, so uh, also following Samir Amin, Gloria Ansaldua, people like that, because the analysis was based on the de determination that the dim dimension of the epistemic was a missing component in the historical process and conceptualization of decolonization. On the other hand, I was quite interested in the history and historicity of cybernetics and the ways in which it questioned, undermined, and kind of relocated 
established epistemologies and methods, essentially the ways in which we understand the concept of knowing and our understanding of how we can know in the first place. In reference to, um, well, the father of cybernetics in that sense, Norbert Wiener, and then a uh, historian of science, uh, Peter Gallison, and uh, the collective Tikkun and, you know, other references, Alexander Galloway investigated in his essay on the black box, black block, why these two meet at the end of the 20th century by looking at the history of cybernetics and the epistemologies and objects it has produced. Galloway proclaims that certain forms of political appropriation of the invisible and illegible, the anonymous and non-identifiable and so on and so on, that all of these uh, kind of come into or get into motion and become the tactical tool of resistance in, the, in cybernetic societies. They produce a politics of appearance, he says, a politics of being. Long-standing traditions in Western philosophy and aesthetics have frequently intertwined knowledge with visual perception, particularly in technologies of representation. I quote from the book, uh, The War of Appearances, Transparency, Opacity, and Radiance. Transparency involves a view of things that understands them as potentially transparent, and the light that pervades them is subsequently the light of mind. But enlightened thinking is not only a switch from philosophy to science, but moreover, one that is fundamentally technological. Exposing the inner workings of things is in fact a technological act. This begs the question if the enlightenment's pursuit of knowledge and understanding, which is still part of our understanding of how to understand, is intrinsically linked to technological progress and methods. If we look at cybernetics and the new dimension it offers epistemologically, we might want to extend first and foremost our understanding of technology from the typically imagined tangible tools, as I mentioned in the beginning, or devices like machinery and, you know, to include much more intangible aspects. Methods and systems of thought that contribute to our ability to comprehend and interact with our environment as offered by cybernetics as a theoretical framework a set of concepts might then shift how technology can be mapped out and made sense of, and thus differently structure our everyday life. Today, currently, we have arrived at what we designate, or is designated to be some of the most complex systems of all times. Machine learning, deep learning, most recently, open AIs, uh, model language, large language, model chat GPT, um, which is based on natural language processing, as you all know. Um, artificial intelligence seems to be a further and significant side where opacity is situated and experienced. In the realm of algorithmic processing, decision-making and output, opacity has the, as the problem in and of the machine symbolizes the programmatic, ethical, or political problem of the capability of humans to understand the technology behind AI. Hence, the identification of opacity becomes that through which a critique of monopolized technological power and capitalism, of algorithmic bias, of data labeling, of scale, and of complexity becomes possible in the first place. So, is opacity the problem or is it an opportunity, the site that allows for critique, or is it that through which an alternative, something else, can be articulated and brought forward? Where I find a true encounter between Glissant's poetics, here only briefly hinted at through opacity, and today's technologically saturated world, I think, is precisely in his profound investigation of the totality of languages. What opacity presupposes is the relation, a slight congruence of human and machine in and through language. After countless adaptions and interpretations of this concept, the idea of opacity is also as enabling, as like a tool that enables something, right? Enabling a specific language, a specific imaginary, a specific idea of other things. And by that being this like very versatile, almost generic term uh, with the capacity of being used in so many different contexts and functions, there is of course a danger it does exhaust at some point. Yet, it offers incredible entanglement. 
And this is what is indicative of and what Glissant articulated uh, in a conversation that he had with Alexandre Le Pen um, as follows. He says, the universal has no language. The universal has no language. There is no universal language, neither human nor machinic or otherwise. Glissant says, language is thus a constitutive force only, only in its relation to other languages. And this, I think, serves as an entry point to a renewed understanding of technology, to make sense of more parts of its history. I'm not saying to renew its history or anything, but to make sense of more parts of its history and to truly establish imaginaries otherwise. And I'm not going to end on this like generic uh, phrase, this like let's imagine otherwise, but I want to actually offer uh, some kind of imagination by telling you a story. And I have to move a little bit. I'm at the last part, so it should be. Okay. I'm sitting down because it's a children's story. Whoops. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, enjoy. Okay, my daughter um, and I borrowed a book from the library, which she had, uh, well, discovered. It's a German children's book, which was written by a German comedian. <laughs> and uh, the book is called Was macht Püb? So translated, the translation would be, what is Püb doing? All right, I'll tell you about it. Poop is a small creature appearing on the first page to ask another small creature where they belong. This other creature is called Plop and tells Poop it belongs to the dropping water tap. It tells Poop that Poop has to find its home, its purpose, somewhere in the world. So Poop goes on a journey and it meets Tatu, Ta and Ta who are the sounds of sirens on an ambulance. ta tu ta and ta It meets do re mi who tell Poop quite cockily that they are not just a geräusch, which could be like sound or noise, but they're actually notes or tones. Poop gets sad a little bit, but then meets who belongs to a shopping cart being dragged over pavement Poop meets Nick Nook, branches breaking on the forest floor and he meets an echo, a creature producing echoes in a valley. A small child steps to the edge of this valley and shouts, hello. And so the echo goes, hello, hello, hello. And it invites Poop to follow suit and see if Poop belongs here maybe. And the echo goes, explains and goes, Hooray! And says, be the echo, do it, poop. And poop goes, poop. They repeat this three times until they realize poop apparently is not an echo. He can't repeat what others say. So finally, poop stumbles across a child in a backyard, trying, to, trying for the hundreds of times to whistle. And poop realizes that this, that this, is the calling. All creatures that Poop encountered invited Poop to join in, but Poop was to find its own purpose, and Poop found where and what it was meant to be. It belonged to this child in this backyard on the sunny day, and Poop was very happy. <laughs> Okay, so this is the very last, very short part of the presentation. Um, I really love this book so much. And I told it to you because there's, of, of course, a point to it. I want to make an argument. <laughs> okay, so I said in the beginning, we are right at the frontiers of what language can do. At these frontiers of what language can do lies the capacity for language to also find you 
to find me, to find us, to find all of us. If we lack the words, they will have been uttered because I, we, all of us, we are many. Language's capacity to find and then forge in turn lies in what we call the collective, of course. When words spoken again and again also need to be embodied, they become silent through the lack of this embodiment. So when every utterance, every politicized term becomes mere content, all the content in the world becomes silent or silence. And if our terms and concepts also constitute the borders of our knowing and doing somehow, language offers the concepts and then it prevents certain articulations maybe. Different articulations make collectivity through their own means and the sake of their emergence. They emerge in emergency, in circumstances of crisis, of pressure to find precisely these articulations. As Binia Damczak describes in her book, Yesterday, Tomorrow, it's a book about um, the times of revolution, um, the communi Communist Party in the 20th century of Europe. Binia writes, the new language drives towards the possibility of another experience. This language of liberation is liberating because in naming injustice, it blasts it out of the status of the self-evident and unquestionable. And at the same time, with the possibility of its communication, it establishes the possibility of collectivity. Injustice is suffered collectively and it can be fought collectively. In the language of class struggle, the class forms itself and fighting, it can anticipate in it the possibility of its own abolition. So is the following, ah, so it is the following question that I want to pose. What is it that we understand technology to be? How do we understand the infrastructure of technology if we speak of building it? Do we understand language to be one with it, congruent? Is language not all of these tools, machines, systems, device? Is it not material, physical, and embodied? Of course, I'm making a kind of old argument here, but I'm also trying to perform what I'm, what I'm implying, right? So I'm trying to articulate something through concepts that limit. Its possibilities lie in a mode of a different articulation a stretching of the power of our imagination and capacities to act on them, to embody what is uttered collectively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nelly. Um, I might have what maybe, I don't know if this will seem like an odd question to you, but it's where I kept um, finding myself when I was listening to you, and it has to do with the lure of, uh, the lure of concepts and also um, the way in which concepts or philosophical ideas travel. And um, I, I guess one thing that's always struck me so much with Gleason's opacity, which, which you absolutely touched on, is how much the concept circulates. And I think you did such a nice job of showing the kind of specificity of Gleason's thinking that you know, opacity is really coming from a, from a place, from a, loca from a location, but yet it's this concept that just has absolutely proliferated and circulated in so many different contexts in different countries, landscapes. And you know, maybe I'm just curious to hear you um, reflect on that more. I don't know if it will take you to a personal, I mean, I have a personal story as well of how that concept actually solicited me. And it was making me think of um, another black studies scholar, Alexander Wahaley in Habeas Viscus. I haven't read that in ages, but I remember at the beginning of that book, there was um, an argument about thinking about um, how, what does it mean for certain ideas to be able to travel, do certain kind of specificities of context fall away as these as ideas move and circulate. So I guess, yeah, on the one hand, it's just I'm curious to hear um, your thoughts more on the way in which opacity moves in the world. And, you know, if you're also open to sharing, I'm curious about, you know, thoughts on, like, the, the lure of it and also how it, how it solicits and how it solicited you. Thank you for the question. Um... <clears throat> 
I don't even know where to start, actually. <laughs> I have so much to say. No, yeah. Um, well, I think to start maybe with also why we're here. Um, I said somewhere in the talk that um, I think there is a certain kind of proliferation of engagement, actually, um, with this particular concept, really because of a media technological condition, um, which had to do with the term of transparency also and how that came up and kind of surfaced again as a very, uh, I don't know, major, like stratifying concept that, you know, informed a lot of different kinds of um, engagements with, you know, media and technology, digital media and technology. Um, and I think that is quite interesting also because Glissant has his own concept of transparency. And so a lot of the times, you know, the concept is taken from mostly the poetics of relation because in there is the very particular formulation of the right to opacity, which as you know, and I mean, I said this also, but he formulated it first uh, at a conference in 1969 in Mexico. So that's like way later <laughs> when he wrote it down in the book. Um, and he says, he, I clamor the right to opacity. And then people engage with it from that book um, and pit it against, uh, you know, a concept of transparency that has to do with a current world situation. But in Poetics of Relation, but especially throughout the entirety of his work, there is uh, a conception of transparency. There is something that he calls transparency, right? Um, it's not only an aesthetic category, I would say, because opacity is often um, first, at least, I guess, negotiated in an, in an aesthetic way, which makes a lot of sense, and then from there goes um, uh, to other realms, maybe. Um, but the concept of transparency in saw is rarely actually then engaged, which to me is very interesting because it's in there and it belongs to it, right? So there is something, because, I mean, I think one of the most important things about his work is that um, there's never an either or, right? There's never binary and you can easily say these things, but it's just not there in Glissant. Because there is, of course, he says, there is a transparency that was kind of forged from, you know, Western modernity and that is also something that is not just like one thing because it's also, it has an evolutionary quality because we're here because of it, right? So we have to make sense of that, like somehow. Um, so there is other transparencies and there is a transparency that he tries to conceptualize uh, in relation to opacity, but also in relation to like uh, the, the, the whole theory of relation, of course. So maybe that's like um, for one thing. Then also opacity exists in from the beginning of when he starts writing like poetry. Um, in his earliest poetry, it's like the French word dru, which means like uh, thick, I guess. Um, um, Neal Aller has written about this. Um, it's, you know, it concerns, for example, um, texture of a plant. And that's also why I spoke about the texture of the paper when ink, you know, uh, touches the paper, stuff like that, because opacity is, of course, also, um, I mean, it's not only a concept in terms of, like, an abstraction of something, but it's, I think, first in his uh, poetry, ve something very, very tangible, and then also um, in all of his, like, I mean, he wrote so many novels and everything, and it's in there in how he writes, it's in there in his characters, it's in there, so there's so many different types of it. And so I think the engagement with opacity also is just like endless. And especially, you know, in the arts, um, there has been a lot like the, I don't know, the Otolis group, uh, Nervous Rerum film, there's a wonderful essay about the film and how they engage with, um, I guess they call it cinematic opacity. So, which has a lot to do, I guess, with, um, it's not only like a refusal to represent something or something, but to acknowledge that it's not re representable and it's fine, you know, and then you have to kind of find another way to do the work you want to do or whatever. But yeah, so, you know, I could talk about this for a very long time. Um, there's really a lot to say about it, but it's, it, it's everywhere, this concept. Um, um, yes, I know. We, we, I think, Maybe we have time for two questions. It would um, let's open it up to the audience if you have questions for Fernelli. Wonderful. Here, oh, you have. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, it's actually a bit following what you just mentioned uh, for the, the answer, and also you mentioned briefly about language, how it changes and all, but it reminds me also James Joyce at the same time that, I don't know exactly his words, but in general it was that language for him was actually the barrier, was the source of limits because each separate words are actually have a proper meaning, but in some languages, these words are actually similar. And then he literally, in many of his books, then use at least 11 languages to be so accurate in what he says because the language has its limits already. And that kind of, it comes back in my mind with what you just mentioned also of like, Okay, it's actually, is the language the barrier or is the usage of language between? Yes, thank you. Um, I think, you know, I mean, what I'm hinting at here, and it was not a talk, like, <coughs> very specifically talking about, like, machinic language, for example, but, you know, machinic language is language, and I'm hinting, of course, at how we think about that and construct it and so on, and how then we can think about how it constructs us and what we can make of it and how we kind of, you know, can escape maybe certain kinds of... Um, um, don't know what to call it, how I want to call it, certain kinds of, let's call it barriers or limitations. Um, but, f so I go back to Glissant. Um, in his work, he, well, he wrote in French, but he came up with a lot of terms, actually. And so, also, going back, actually, to your question, I should have said this, <laughs> actually, but, um, he says this somewhere, but opacity for him first was an experience, which was when he arrived in France after leaving Martinique as a young, you know, student um, who wanted to go to the motherland, like the, you know, from the periphery to the center, which is what it was called always, right? And then he arrived and kind of, well, encountered a lot of different things. Among them, for example, that the French spoken in France was very different from that in Martinique, of course, and then also that there were a lot of terms that he didn't know because they didn't need them, and then a lot of terms that he would be using, people in France wouldn't know, right? It's a very simple, like, you know, you get there and you're like, what? Oh, it doesn't kind of work out. I thought it was like we were part of this, and then, I mean, with this come, of course, a lot of other experiences, precisely because you're a black man and you know you're not part of France, uh, uh, actually, and stuff like that. So racializing experiences and other. Um, but this was kind of the first experience of a certain kind of opacity because then he realized, okay, I cannot even translate this just like that, even if it's like it's the same language. Okay, so, um, and then in his writing, apart from that, he r really actually practices opacity. I feel like like there's a lot of people, and I mean, we have that maybe with a lot of like post-structuralist like post -structuralist thinkers, you know, who kind of opposed, all of them opposed a very transparent reading and also writing of text so that you could just kind of go in there and then you would have the meaning like that. Um, and they would all say, right, it's not possible. But um, I think there's a particular kind of engagement with Glissant where people say, I, I don't understand this. Because he practiced something, you know, and he wanted, ma he wanted to make something apparent. And then also he used Creole words, words sometime, and then also he came up with his own words. So for example, the Toumont, for example, or there's a lot of like, um, in, in relation to opacity, um, he talks about a term, yeah, it's related to the whole theory, whatever, but it's, it's translated into English as giving on and with, in the, instead of just like providing something. And with that come different, you know, a different thinking emerges, uh, emerges different imaginations appear, stuff like that. So I think, yeah, I, I, th I hope that resonates with what you said, but I think that Glissant is uh, precisely as well thinking a lot about the limitations of, of language and then kind of trying to, you know, develop a certain type of, not a certain type, actually like a poetics and write poetry and believe in the power of language to also do something, you know, you know, and like let something emerge, yeah, both at the same time because it's and more also because it's not just this or that, right? So. I'm so, that too long. No, I'm so sorry to say we're no, out of fine. time, but um, thank you so much, Nelly. Thank you for getting up so early to come. I incredibly, would do it again and again and <laughs> incredibly again. Incredibly grateful. Um, let's give Nelly a round of applause, everyone. Thank you also.